Um, and now to start the session, so today we have Mr. Karthik Kumar. The session is all about starting up and a journey ahead. Mr. Karthik is an entrepreneur and founder of Evm, the data company, and also training Sidebase, which is India's number one art-based soft skills behavioral training. Mr. Karthik has also launched his debut book on 7 September 2018. So it's called Don't Cross Startup. So basically, he records his entrepreneurial journey here. Now, the book here was written from the perspective, I wish I had known these things when I started my own entrepreneurial venture. Before um, in inviting Mr. Karthik for a session, I would also like to thank Art Mojo for the gift sponsor. So ladies and gentlemen, please invite actor, director, author, and stand-up comedian and co-founder, Mr. Karthik for the session. I have the responsibility of making sure that this is as engaging and meaningful to both of us as possible. I'm equally selfish, I want something out of this. I hope you get what you want out of this. So let's start by just stating expectations of what you would like from the session. Maybe I'll meet it, maybe I'll know what I'm going to disappoint you about. Uh, so I'll tell you what I represent as an entrepreneur and um, why I wrote the book. Um, because I, I, I didn't write a book because I felt like I should write a book in life. I felt like I'm forgetting my entire feeling of having been a startup because my company has moved out of startup phase in the last six, seven years. And I was almost feeling like I'm forgetting that feeling of what it felt like because we were, as an organization, we were uh, in startup mode for a longer time than usually companies are in startup mode. Right, you know, like for instance, we were at the, um, in 2008, we were at uh, Taj Mahal Hotel in Bombay and we were part of our top 30 hottest startups. All right, finalists at the Tata, Any, and New Entrepreneurs Network Foundation. And there were top 30 across India who got selected to represent and have a, what, a brainstorming session. We were the only arts-based uh, startup in that 30. And we were literally like uh, uh, sheep in the wild jungle because we didn't know what uh, venture capital was. We did not know what is the way in which you organizedly solicit investors. We didn't know the nature of the other businesses as well because none of them were in our immediate ecosystem. And we also did not have an ecosystem that we were functioning in. Today, if I were to say arts-based startups and performing arts entrepreneurships, there is absolutely nothing in this country right now. Most uh, performing arts enterprises today are largely funded by a benevolent fund and therefore they they get that grant and they, they do whatever with the mandate of that grant or they are uh, amateur groups that seek sponsorship in the form of brands and they do their own little amateur cultural activities that goes on. Uh, you will find that even Star Wars like in the uh, Tamil arts field like a crazy Mohan or S.V. Shekhar always maintain their identities as amateur. Right? They will actually be called amateur organizations because that's what they do. They don't do this for a living per se because they can't mind this to make enough of a living for the entire repertory, so to speak. All right, so we were in that um, uh, top 30 room there, top 30 startups, and there were, of course, retail startups, tech startups, a few social entrepreneurships at that point of time. And uh, we felt we were like, we don't know what we were doing there. But it just gave us some form of legitimacy saying, we are also a startup. And I was forgetting that entire feeling of what it felt like. And we were there in that startup phase for from 2003 to almost 2012, nine years of being a startup, imagine, I mean, it, I was forgetting that feeling and I wanted to put it down because we made so many mistakes in that phase that I wanted somebody else to read so that they don't make the same mistakes again, they make new ones, right? Because we came into entrepreneurship like, like absolute first generation entrepreneurs. We did not know what entrepreneurship was we did not even think of it as an option until very much later in life. And I'll tell you why, therefore, we chose entrepreneurship as such. All right? And um, uh, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm possibly the median educated person in this country right now. Very median, urban median, I am. Because I'm an, I had to do engineering because I didn't think, I, didn't, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I lacked imagination, so I just went, into the sh went in and did my engineering degree. After finishing engineering, I said I must do an MBA of some sort. So I did a marketing uh, degree at uh, at a school in Ahmedabad called Maika. So I finished that. All through this six years of education, which is 
generally a period in which the rest of the world will not will not interfere with you. Will not ask you what are you doing with your life. As long as you have a degree and you're pursuing that degree, the rest of the society and the uncle's network will not bother you. All right. So you have a certain period of uh, you know you're 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 absolutely insulated from societal interference. In that six years, the 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 greed to make a living out of because I realize that making a living is an imperative thing. People have to make a living apparently, right? Because we are living in the urban world and therefore we have to earn money, at least earn money to pay for ourselves and our upkeep and stuff like that. And therefore we have to be self-generating incomes, all right? So we can't even consider being farmers and till the land because farmers are the best entrepreneurs. But we are not. We are urban. We're stuck. We don't know farming. We are. We are, a, we are a social experiment in the world right now. We think we run the world, we don't. We are, we are just an insulated, like, a, uh, what is that, um, Jim Truman's world. Have you seen that Truman, yeah. Truman show? We are all in a strange Truman show. Right? We think we are making money and we are generating something. We are making, all of us are aiming to make enough money so that we can pay for our stupid bills and potential EMIs in the future. All right? So in this little social experiment, it was important that you have to make a living for yourself. So at that point of time, we said entrepreneurship, maybe entrepreneurship. Right? Why can't we do something? Why should we have to work for somebody else? If we have the option of working for ourselves, why can't we do the jugaad for ourselves? Right? Anyway, you're going to do jugaad. Why don't you do it for yourself? But in that six years, I actually got the greed of doing some things that I really liked. I liked acting. I like to tell stories. I like theater. I like the live performing arts. I said, why can't I make my living out of this? If I could make my living out of this, at least working will not seem like working. Working will seem like uh, like uh, eating celery, negative calories. You, know? you lose weight by eating more. <laughs> right? So it felt like, why can't that be the way in which it can work? So if I could marry my interest with the need to make a living, then I'm sorted in life. So therefore, the need for entrepreneurship was born because there was nobody going to give me a job in the storytelling arts field because I'm not genetically grown to be an artist or a storyteller because in India, people accord pedigree through genetics. <laughs> as soon as Sachin's baby is born, you know that I believe he can be a cricketer. I believe it, and our collective belief as a society gives a lot of people a lot of talent. Right? You know, Taimur Ali Khan's future for the rest of his life. You know, he's he's, he's winning six film fairs for sure. Right? He's getting a launch pad. Everything is going to be done. So. Genetically, I'm not qualified to be a storyteller, director, stand-up comic, author, nothing. Nothing is running in the family. <laughs> right? Different things are running, but not these things. All right? So fighting that inertia of somebody else believing in you. Because like, let me tell you, like, I don't think Sachin Tendulkar ever had a problem in his life deciding what he had to do for a living. Because people I'm sure around him are constantly telling him his on drives are fabulous, the back foot drive is superb. You are meant to be a cricketer because he does this one thing magnificently. We, speaking on behalf of the median, right, we're not so great at one thing. We are somewhat okay in many things. Okay, mostly very bad at the one thing that you like doing that you do it for the first time. You're like, oh my god, I'm so bad at this, right? But the problem is we have intellect, or at least we believe we have intellect. So we have very high standards. Sing Panna, Indamari Sing Panna. Cricket Aadna, Indamari Aadna. You know, we are actually, in, our intellect actually inhibits us. Because we, we are armchair critics, no? We, we know how, when we watch um, even a program like Shark Tank, we know which businesses should be bought and which should not be bought. <laughs> we know, we're sitting there, we're like, we have figured it all out. We know who should be winning Super Singer. We know what should the what should MS Dhoni be doing in the IPL and the finals. We know the strategy. We're sitting there saying, figure it out. We don't ever emotionally participate because we've never been allowed ourselves to participate in those scenarios. Because when you are there, one dangerous animal comes into play, which is your emotional self. Your emotional self is what is going to cause you to get inhibited or to become glorious in any situation that you're potentially going to put yourself in. You never know what your emotional self will do until you go into that situation. You'll never know what your emotional self will do until you actually become an entrepreneur and you have that, that money that you've already put into that situation. You'll never know what it is to actually go to market and see how much of a reach I'll get because your emotional self and the way it will react to that scenario 
or that situation will define how your product will go to market at that point of time. We disacknowledge the emotional selves of ourselves. We disacknowledge it. Why? Because the fact that we have, we're always, we have the Satan sitting at all points of time in our entrepreneurship called money. Right? And money tends to inhibit your emotional side. Money says, don't take risks. Be careful. Money tends to like straight jacket you so that you don't do crazy things. Right? Because if you do crazy things, investors will not like you, the market will not react. We don't want absolute anybody to go absolutely ballistic overnight. We want predictability. <coughs> we want you to be straight jacketed. We want you to be um, uh, tell us where you're going and go exactly there. Don't go anywhere else. Right? Now that's the problem with the intellectual self because it does not allow us to fly. It does not allow us to jump. It says jumping is irrational. Why don't you just take small baby steps and reach there? And if you don't believe in jumping, you'll never ever consider flying. Right? Because flight is possible. Because what causes flight? Not physics, but imagination. Thought causes flight. Thought is largely dictated, should largely be dictated by your emotion. Because your imagination is your thought taking flight. Right? So most importantly, as before you become an entrepreneur, I think one of the most beautiful things that my, and I'm lucky to be an entrepreneur in the arts, because the arts on one side is all about releasing your imagination, releasing all constraints. Think of a situation without constraints and then you design something. Because we are so used to thinking within constraints that when I give you infinite budget and infinite time, you don't know what to do. Because we are, again, the problem we all suffer from is called middle class malady. We love the constraints that are put on us because the constraints define us. We define ourselves with our constraints. We enjoy them. We, are, we have the privilege of complaining about them. We love it. We love complaining about our constraints because when we don't have constraints, we actually don't know what to do. With blank canvas, what the hell do I do? What do I do with it? Right? So, the arts helps my business at all points of time to think absolutely irrationally. And the intellectual side or the business side of it disciplines us because at the end of the day, money is an important index to measure your progress by. It's not the means. It's not the end, it is just an index which tells you how well you're doing. It's like a pulse point, it's like a blood flow in your ecosystem. If the blood is not flowing to some organs, you will definitely have problems with those organs. If the blood flow is smooth and it's absolutely as it should be, the pressure points are all perfectly fine, then your organization is functioning very well. It's not the end of the organization, it's actually a gauge of how well the organization is doing. So if you use money as an index to measure how your company is doing, then you're fine. But if you use money as an uh, end in itself of your organization, then you're probably, your organization will die in achieving those numbers. Right? So the entrepreneurship that we got into actually helped us. We actually think irrationally sometimes and then act rationally after that. Can you imagine infinitely and then realize finitely? So that's how we got into this. And as entrepreneurs, and I'm telling you this, um, you must imagine situations that you're going to go into. Imagine it as if they're real. Imagine that you're actually taking your product to market and you're getting the reach that you want. How would you be there? You can actually teleport yourself into that future as if it's now. Because your emotional side can take you there. Emotionally, you are already an entrepreneur, my friend. You are already an entrepreneur if you take yourself there. Not say that in the future, that, no, the future is now. Why don't you imagine how your emotional self will be? Because most entrepreneurship, most things like making a sale, realize we're so, it's so important to make a sale once you become an entrepreneur. You can't just say, I've invented something and you go sell itself. You've got to go sell, right? What is selling but imagining the eventuality of having made the sale? You're not going into a sale saying, I hope I sell this. You're going to a sale saying, oh, I'm just the medium that's already going to manifest this, which has already been done. It's the future. And if it doesn't get sold, you actually come out saying, wow, I, I can't believe I didn't sell it today. And you're mildly delusional. 
And believe me, all entrepreneurs have to feed off this eternal sense of hope, optimism to the point of being mildly delusional. Because you're selling something that probably does not exist in its current shape and form in the market out there. You are trying to change the world. You are being Gandhian about it. You're saying, be the change you want to be in the world. You are becoming the change. Because why else would you create something if there was already a better solution for it out there? Your solution is obviously in your head. You think of it as being better or faster or cheaper or new. Or a paradigm shift in the way in which people should look at things. Right? You are changing the world a bit. Right? You should imagine that the change has already happened because you exist. You exist. Your imagination and your belief and your emotional side gives you ratification that it's real. You are not the future, you are the present, it's already happened. Right, so this, just this, this emotional side of us, we tend to inhibit and we don't tap. And I went to business school, I have my friends going to business school, they don't talk about the side because they're scared about the side. They're scared because the markets want predictability, investors want, uh, want you to be absolutely rigid and regimental about what you're doing right now. People are scared of absolutely imaginative, crazy people. Unless they deliver on with, uh, with, uh, with a track record. But I'm telling you this, as human beings, as a species, we are the, the best version of our species was when we were two, three, four years old. We were playing, we were innovative, we were creative, we were mischievous, we were we were uh, entitled, we were enjoying play, we were the best versions of ourselves until we got into the conventional education system. And that was the beginning of the end. Right? Because after that it was all about marking ourselves and grading ourselves on things that they wanted us to know about. And I don't think things they wanted us to know about has ever helped us as much as our absolute natural selves when we were born. We had the ability to cope, we had the ability to fall and not get hurt. We had absolute imagination and we were the purest versions of ourselves. We were probably the most genius creators at the point of time. And then we learned about risk. We learned about money. Money always comes with so much of like diktats around it, right? Money says, this is how much money you should make. This is your self-worth. Money comes with a, with a with a sense of, usually in South India, it comes with a sense of vulgarity, saying, oh God, displays of money. Oh. A vulgar display of money. Money is something that you should not talk about. Never ask somebody what they make in life. Money is that something that you need to keep aside for the future. So many such thoughts get associated with money without ever realizing that money is actually at some level, it's something that should be available just enough to be able to do what you want to do at that point of time so that it takes you to the next step forward. We plan money as if like like as if like we can actually plan weather. Right? We will plan saying 20 years from now, you see this money sitting here right now will actually serve. How do you know? How do you know what low pressure is getting created somewhere? That money will move and will go away and you'll be like, what the hell was I doing with it? I could have used it when I could have used it. Right? Because you don't, you can't predict time. You can't because time has emotion. Chaos has emotion. We act like rational beings saying the world is absolutely rational and will act according to my predictive theories because my educational system has taught me so. That's so, that's so, that's so intellectually, like uh, with what egos we have, like we can actually predict what the markets will do and what our entrepreneurship is going to do. So my story of entrepreneurship, if we could delve into it at some point of time with just interactions, is actually managing chaos. Managing a lot of chaos because we offered a product in the market that didn't exist in its current form. We had to innovate business models. And when I say innovate, I'm using a very suave term. We had to desperately flail our arms in the swimming pool to figure out what, why do I make this damn thing sustainable? Right? So we had to innovate what we call business models. Then we floated off enterprises when we had opportunities to float off enterprises because somebody knocked and slapped us into saying, that's an opportunity. I'm like, oh, okay. We were so busy surviving, we didn't know these opportunities could exist. We're getting better at it over a period of time, therefore we are never at any point of time the entrepreneurship which says that we've got it sorted. We know that it's a journey, it's a beautiful journey. If you commit to it, 
you are in it, there are so many magnificent rewards. If there was one religion I could evangelize, it would be entrepreneur, entrepreneurism. Because it's the one journey that you will actually, or you'll, you'll see your work see fruit. And you'll see that fruit being used by the world and be of some use and you'll be like, wow, we were a part of making that happen. That feels so good. It feels so fabulous. Because it's really like, I mean, when the Bhagavad Gita says your karma, your action, what can we leave behind? We can probably, if we are not, we're not, we're not going to be, none of us are going to be politicians or none of us are going to be like, like, uh, I hope not. <laughs> All right? We're going, to, we're going to leave our karma with our companies, our enterprises that we're And how can those enterprises be a significant part of the landscape that we operate in? How can it contribute to a positive world around us? Because that's the only karma we leave behind. And if we could do that, we would probably, our spirits will be happy. The emotional sides will be like glorious even when the body has left us. So that's my story. Um, theater is about application. Where all can I apply?